Thank you very much for that uh, uh, extraordinarily generous uh, uh, introduction. Uh, I've, uh, in addition to knowing Dean, I um, regard myself as particularly privileged for knowing his father, who uh, is uh, maybe not so well known in many circles, but he is, uh, was one of the uh, most important figures in bringing the Cold War to a peaceful end. So uh, I, I feel, feel particularly privileged to have this opportunity. And uh, uh, I, I've been asked to, uh, uh, to, to do a little bit of uh, American-centric kinds of uh, uh, commentary here. So some of this uh, is not so much intended to be advocacy as, as description. The, uh, you, uh, some of the aspirations that have been expressed uh, in the UK about asp aspirations for a, uh, a UK version of DARPA is, is a very interesting subject, uh, uh, particularly to me because the uh, Defense Science Board that uh, I uh, chaired for about nine years has a particularly intimate relationship with DARPA. Our current director, uh, uh, sorry, our current chairman of the Defense Science Board was a former director of DARPA. So we, we, it's, it's uh, something we know uh, quite a bit about and, and something that knows we know what works well, uh, and so I'll, I'll get in that into a little bit, a little bit of uh, detail. What I want to go through here uh, in my remarks is uh, first uh, uh, a little bit of a scene setter as to how the uh, U.S. Uh, got to where it is with uh, the uh, need to create an institution like DARPA and uh, nurture it, and uh, what k kinds of approaches have worked and what ha what have not. Uh, uh, then I want to have a bit of a uh, discussion about uh, what's b evolved in modern warfare that's uh, so fundamentally changed that uh, we need to think about how to deal with this problem, including our research enterprises, to, uh, uh, to address it. I'll have a short uh, uh, discourse on, on space policy where I think there's some real opportunities for uh, UK to, to, uh, uh, to become more involved in space. And then finally, uh, uh, a discussion about uh, uh, DARPA and uh, what works and what we think doesn't work. Uh, it's a, a trite but nevertheless true observation that necessity is a, the uh, mother of invention. Uh, for most nations, there are few domains of public investment that offer a more compelling necessity than national defense. Hence, the process of the conversion of the insights derived from the frontier of science and, and, and converting that, those insights into technologies, which in turn create military capabilities, has been a characteristic of nation states for centuries. Uh, the uh, wartime creation, uh, uh, or say the military applications of atomic energy during World War II and, and uh, digital computers are certainly uh, uh, well-known uh, scientific achievements uh, and engineering innovations as well, whose applications have had profound implications for modern life. But in digging a little more deeply, it's, uh, it may be useful to uh, consider how the technologies of atomic energy and digital computers evolved from their um, military to civil applications. The, the, trans, the, the tr transition of these technologies fr from military to civil applications illustrate uh, Peter Tile's observation concerning the government regulation of innovation. Uh, Tile observed that uh, government practice, uh, government regulatory practice uh, regulates atoms while bits are unregulated. And uh, the point is, is not, always, uh, not always true everywhere, but it's, it is a useful generalization as to why uh, IT-based technologies enable a rich environment for innovation compared to the more highly regulated activities of, uh, of atomic energy. In uh, 1953, President Eisenhower uh, proposed uh, Atoms of P for Peace uh, as an approach to developing the civil applications of atomic energy. Uh, however, the civil applications were then and now a government-dominated uh, uh, activity and regulated in almost every nation that, that uh, applies atomic energy to civil applications. As a result, the innovation has been relatively slow because the pace of the regulatory activities uh, is inconsistent with private financing of its applications and the pace of implementation of innovative ap applications of those technologies. The, the users need things that, that uh, appear more rapidly than that industry is able to provide. 
the evolution of the digital computers uh, differed. Following World War II, the, the government developed knowledge of uh, digital computers, both uh, here and in, in the U.S., was widely shared with private industry, and the rate of progress was and remains extraordinary. Today, many new technologies that can be reduced to information, for example, genomics, biology, telecoms, etc., can then be processed in the form of software and, uh, and integrated with modern uh, techniques of modeling and simulation. The development of application using uh, modeling and simulation can diminish and in some cases eliminate uh, time-consuming and costly uh, experiments, contribute to the creation of technologies uh, and their applications that often grow at an exponential rate rather than the linear fashion that we're uh, most familiar with. Uh, the growth of the underlying technologies of autonomy are, in many cases, growing at an exponential rate that is accelerating the development of the fielding of autonomous vehicles and the Internet of Things as uh, just two examples uh, that uh, I think are now, by now widely known. Uh, adapting to the rapid uh, growth of uh, the core technologies that enable mo um, uh, modern military capabilities has be become the most challenging uh, Char uh, characteristic of modern life. These circumstances illustrate an important as uh, aspect of how the innovation process for national defense is being changed in fundamental ways. Historically, uh, the application of advanced technology for defense purposes was undertaken in government arsenals, usually in secret, for subsequent wartime application. The civil applications of these circumstances then slowly trickle, trickle down to the civil sector. In the American setting, uh, the constitutional injunction to maintain a navy but raise an army left um, America unprepared uh, uh, for the vast uh, scale of global conflict that characterized the first half of the 20th century. This hard-won experience reinforced uh, uh, the importance of alliance relationships in uh, U.S. foreign policy and the necessity of having a responsive science and technology as well as an industrial base in place long before the conflict begins. Uh, an expedient uh, civil uh, uh, or defense industrial infrastructure was created uh, uh, during World War II uh, and uh, it, uh, it, uh, uh, demise followed uh, quickly thereafter, but af following the Korean War, that uh, defense industrial enterprise was revived and became a permanent, uh, permanent part of the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, defense establishment. Uh, it's, to, to get some uh, reference point on the scale, this defense industrial enterprise that was created during uh, World War II uh, supported 16 million um, Americans who served in the armed forces, and, and the underlying defense industrial base employed 24 million people during World War II. So it's a very uh, 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 recent uh, experience, but one that's sort of seared into the uh, consciousness, particularly of the Congress that has taken particular interest in, in it, and uh, the Defense Science Board that I uh, now serve as a member is uh, starting a study on a modern defense industrial base that is filled with the kind of technologies that are not normally uh, present in the industrial base. How, how do you uh, spin the industrial base up to, to deal with the uh, uh, technologies that are uh, changing every 18 or 24 months and, and still be able to, uh, to, to operate military forces successfully? So, uh, the, uh, as I said, this wartime uh, expedient uh, uh, industrial base uh, became a permanent part of uh, uh, daily life since the, the uh, uh, mid-50s. Uh, the technologies that underpinned the, the Cold War cycles of modernization and recapitalization continue to develop in the U.S. and, uh, and later within the Alliance uh, Defense Industrial Base as Europe uh, rearmed in the uh, uh, 50s and early 60s. The U.S. began this pr process of integrating new technologies, for advance, example, advanced materials, which was a major contributor to the development of high-performance jet engines, manufacturing technology, microelectronics, space operations, and so forth, to create uh, advanced military capabilities during the 60s and 70s. Uh, to broaden uh, access to this technology, 
the, uh, in the 1980s, the DOD uh, deregulated foreign direct investment in the U.S. defense sector. Uh, and it's now permitted about 200 uh, non-U.S. companies to participate in the U.S. defense uh, market to uh, be able, their U.S. subsidiaries have been able to get security clearances. They have the same contract rights as uh, indigenous companies, and they can participate in the U.S. foreign military sales program. So some of the larger U.K. companies like BAE Systems, uh, uh, Megat, and so forth have been very successful in the uh, U.S. defense market. And in some cases, their uh, uh, U.S. subsidiary has, uh, financial performance ex and, and technology level exceeds that of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the parent operating outside of the U.S. Uh, the, the inexorable uh, transition of uh, defense technology from an activity dominated by kinetic operations on a massive industrial scale evolved during the 1980s to a mixture of uh, uh, both kinetic and non-kinetic operations. This was uh, the early days of the introduction of uh, the technologies of information. These capabilities were pr predominantly created by the technologies of information. Uh, recent U.S. history uh, illustrates the, the scope, scale, and impact of these trends and the rapidity of their uh, application. Uh, in 1991, in the uh, multinational operation, Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield, uh, that was intended to expel uh, uh, Iraq from Kuwait, uh, after four, a four-day day period of uh, day and night, all weather operations involving nearly 500,000 U.S. troops, a logistics support force of 4,000 contract personnel from 76 U.S. companies and 22 foreign contractors, and a supply infrastructure of 360,000 military cargo containers. Uh, and, uh, a few years later, and, and without uh, trying to engage in the uh, uh, resolving the intense uh, diplomatic and policy disputes surrounding the subsequent U.S. and allied uh, operations in Iraq and elsewhere, little more than a decade later, offer some useful insights. The military outcome of major combat operations reflected the growing dominance of information on the battlefield and its importance to the narrative about the path of innovation. During uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, 177,000 coalition forces, including 130,000 from the U.S., about one-third of the complement they had in, in 1991, again conducted continuous day and night all-weather combat operations throughout Iraq for 21 days to defeat Iraq's forces. Employing the technologies of information enabled combat operations with significantly smaller troop complement than previously been required. This was possible because the technologies of information had a profound effect on reducing the scale of operations needy needed to produce uh, decisive military effects. Modern information-based technologies of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance reduced the fog of war to an extent that much smaller forces were needed uh, because of the desired military effect could be created without the need to retain large uh, reserve forces. Um, in this context, we could argue that uh, bandwidth uh, to uh, collect, process, and disseminate tactically decisive information in a, class of, in a timely manner uh, effectively allowed the combatant commander to replace large reserve forces with the insights created by IT-enabled uh, uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. In some sense, uh, bandwidth became a uh, substitute for force structure, which is uh, uh, an observation that uh, continues to be reflected in the way f uh, uh, certainly U.S. forces are developing. Uh, the cumulative effect of the increasing role of inf information and more generally the importance of the technologies developed outside of the defense sector has significantly reduced the burden of national defense. The technologies produced outside of the defense sector are uh, more or less by uh, definition products of a competitive economy. So the, uh, you're getting uh, these products at uh, closer to the marginal cost of the, the, compared to technologies that are developed uniquely for the uh, defense sector. Um, uh, in, at the zenith of the Cold War, during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, nearly 10% of the U.S. GDP was devoted to national defense. 
Today, that figure has declined by two-thirds, despite the large increase in defense expenditure since 2017. National defense today only absorbs 3 percent of the U.S. GDP. Uh, in in uh, uh, thinking about uh, w uh, what is changing in uh, national defense, because it will couple to the arguments I, I'll advance later about uh, 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 creating a UK DARPA, is is important to uh, uh, to recognize. The characteristics of modern warfare, enabled by the growing role of information in the national defense function, has made it increasingly difficult for the legal and diplomatic practices built around classic kinetic military operations to function effectively. Hostile acts can now be taken invisibly and long before the first shot is fired. Uh, these pre-kinetic uh, measures can vastly increase the scope, duration, and destructiveness of a conflict. With few elements of warfare that, uh, a few elements of uh, warfare that are enabled by modern technology, I think, will be illustrative. Uh, first, uh, the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. The civil infrastructure that enables modern warfare is highly vulnerable and likely to be exploited. The modern practice of warfare, uh, reinforced by international law, was uh, focused on engagements between the military forces of na nation states. The uh, devastating experience in World War II resulting from the practice of targeting civilians and their infrastructure has readily, uh, regrettably, I would say, been expanded uh, in the 21st century. Uh, information technology enabled vulnerabilities in both civil and military infrastructure provide new opportunities to engage an adversary. This includes attacks on the adversary's homeland to diminish the capacity of its defense industrial base to respond to operational needs, as well as the ability of the armed forces to be uh, marshaled uh, and uh, uh, deployed to a conflict. Rather than being attacked last, the homeland uh, in non-kinetic form is likely to be attacked first by uh, state adversaries. Uh, the remarkable capabilities created by the uh, incorporation of information technology in modern civil infrastructure have also created extraordinary vulnerabilities. In the U.S., the 17 elements of critical infrastructure are linked to the day-to-day -day operations of both civil society and the defense establishment. Their shared vulnerability unites them. Their uh, prolonged loss is, uh, would also be catastrophic to both U.S. security and its economy. The uh, civil infrastructure uh, is an indip indispensable element of na uh, national capacity to mobilize and deploy resources for a conflict abroad. The uh, U.S. deployment of uh, its uh, military forces uh, is based on the expectation of a secure homeland. Uh, the, while some measures are being taken to mitigate the exposure of the uh, key elements of the, uh, uh, the critical infrastructure, they are likely to be concentrated on the ability of the armed forces to mobilize, deploy, and sustain uh, military operations. The civil infrastructure uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, very much at risk because the American way of war is uh, to uh, mobilize in the uh, uh, continental U.S. and uh, deploy abroad. But if, uh, as we'll see with uh, uh, the ability to implant uh, malicious code, say, in uh, uh, ele the electric grid, uh, oh, there's only one U.S. base that, uh, that has uh, uh, an organic source of electric power on the base. Uh, they, they use uh, geothermal in one site in California. All the others are tied to the civil power grid. So if, if those uh, electric power grids are, are successfully attacked, it also undermines the ability of uh, the forces to, uh, to deploy. Uh, uh, second point here is uh, that uh, modern threats are increasingly built around very rapidly developing dual-use technologies that are challenging both the security and competitiveness of all industrial democracies, not just the U.S. China has institutionalized its aspirations for the development and exploitation of advanced technology, uh, particularly dual-use technologies with military and civil applications. Although its public advocacy of its uh, policy 
has been attenuated to mitigate f trade friction, its Made in China 2025 policy remains the organizing principle for state investment. Uniquely, China has integrated its investment strategy in these technologies with its policy of civil-military fusion. Uh, this approach enables China to um, uh, en enables China to extract the military applications of these technologies in parallel with I its uh, civil benefits. The uh, uh, the uh, uh, economic institutions in, in the U.S. certainly, and, and I think uh, generally the case elsewhere, has been first to develop the civil applications and then find military applications, which are usually a, a much smaller part of these uh, civil products. But the Chinese uh, have specifically focused on uh, ten areas of uh, investment that uh, have uh, both civil and, and military uh, applications. Uh, the, uh, uh, one of the other uh, problems, certainly the case in the U.S., and I think uh, is more generally a characteristic of uh, defense establishments, is that they tend to be risk-averse with respect to adopting uh, modern technology. So the, uh, th there's a tendency for defense uh, establishments to uh, wait until the, the civil technology is fairly mature before they adopt it. And uh, that... Uh, is not the case in China, where they are seeking to uh, rapidly uh, integrate uh, uh, the, the military dimension of uh, new, uh, new, uh, advanced civil technologies through the, uh, their civil military fusion. Uh, uh, third point uh, with respect to this uh, uh, characterizing the domain of modern warfare is the domains of conflict are more numerous and complex in their interaction with kinetic uh, op uh, op military operations offering opportunities for clandestine preparation of the battlefield long before the outbreak of hostilities uh, as well as throughout the period of conflict. Uh, the, the familiar domains of uh, armed conflict, land, sea, and air, continue to dominate the thinking of uh, uh, the public in general and, and most governments for that matter. However, since the Cold War, including or enabled perhaps by the, the availability of these, uh, these uh, uh, technologies, um, the, the intense applications of information, uh, uh, several, seven additional domains of conflict have been added, including space in the physical domain, uh, in the uh, virtual domain, cyber, uh, electromagnetic manipulation of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, and information operations, and then uh, through the ability to manipulate social media and other uh, instruments of uh, being able to communicate with uh, one's uh, adversary, uh, the human uh, dimension of uh, human domains of warfare, social, moral, and cognitive, are also part of the uh, uh, of uh, uh, modern warfare. Uh, among the the most uh, uh, significant military uh, developments, uh, bringing the Cold War to a peaceful end, was the DARPA-led developments of what became known as Assault Breaker One. Uh, th this um, was a, uh, based on a Defense Science Board study in the early 1970s. The technology uh, enabled concept of operation that w was uh, developed was aimed at the core of Soviet m uh, military power in Europe. And as I will hear, say later, the, the way DARPA operates is, is to use technology uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, affect a, a military mission and affect uh, it, the, these aspirations are, create the demand signal to find uh, uh, technology or technologies that can contribute to the outcome, and I'll have more to say about that in, in detail. But in any case, this Assault Breaker 1 conf concept uh, uh, w was recognized that the, the, that the core of Soviet military power in Europe since 1945 was based on their ability to reinforce the uh, uh, the uh, group, Soviet uh, group of forces in Germany and, and the Czech Republic with their uh, reserves that were massed in the uh, uh, Western military districts. The ability to inter interdict that, that um, uh, those, uh, the introduction of those echelon reserves uh, w was the, uh, the heart of uh, Soviet uh, military power. And Salt Breaker 1 was aimed at using the technologies of uh, 
uh, airborne ground surveillance to have precision uh, uh, geolocation day and night of the, uh, these forces and to be able to strike them with great precision uh, with uh, 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 conventional forces, conventional military uh, kinetic uh, operations. Uh, and this integration of uh, uh, these capabilities uh, really denied the Soviet forces the capacity to defeat uh, NATO's conventional military force in, in Europe. The Soviet and Warsaw Pact recognized this ground truth uh, created by these technology-enabled te technology military capabilities, which in turn contributed to the unraveling of the Warsaw Pact and the collapse of, uh, collapse of Soviet military power and authority in uh, Europe in the 1989-91 period. Uh, uh, China's uh, foreign policy aims have also evolved significantly since the end of the Cold War. China has expanded the geographic scope of its aspirations. Uh, these have grown from the days of the Deng Xiaoping era, 1978 to 92, where China sought to become the leading state in the East Asian region, uh, a, a develop, an important development, but, but was not seen as a uh, uh, threat to uh, uh, U.S. or allied interests. Uh, China's uh, emerging global aspirations to become the world's leading economic and military power by 2049, uh, developed under uh, President Xi, were codified in the 19th Party Congress of the uh, Communist Party in, in 2017. These developments increase the risk of uh, conflict in the future. Similarly, Russia's aspirations to modernize and become uh, culturally and economically integrated with Europe following the collapse of the former Soviet Union were quickly abandoned following the uh, end of the Yeltsin administration. It was replaced by a Eurasia-focused kleptocratic leadership under uh, President Vladimir Putin in 1999. Russian policy regards the U.S. as the main adversary and initiated a large program of uh, modernization of its strategic and sub-strategic forces in 2009 following the uh, uh, sp signing of the Spirit of Prague Declaration and the New START Treaty. Um, the the uh, uh, Russia changed its doctrine, military doctrine or nuclear doctrine in 2004 to include the uh, uh, use of nuclear weapons in conventional conflicts. Chinese and Russian military co cooperation, including joint exercises from the Baltic Sea to the South China Sea, have become a regular feature of their shared military activities. Chinese and Russian defense collaboration has been uh, complemented by increasing diplomatic uh, collaboration on, uh, on a global basis, undermining U.S. alliance relationships and leveraging Russia's private military contractors to conduct uh, military operations that its uh, government seeks to deny in their so-called gray zone uh, uh, operations, such as they uh, conducted in, uh, in Crimea, uh, southeastern Ukraine, Syria, and uh, six con uh, countries in Africa. Taken together, these developments led the U.S. government to reduce the prominence of its counterintelligence or counterterrorism focus, I should say, uh, w without abandoning uh, uh, without abandoning it, and to change its uh, national security strategy. In 2017, the U.S. government promul promulgated a new national security strategy that emphasized the need to be capable of deterring and defeating the full range of threats to the United States, including. Uh, China and Russia as peer competitor states. This evol uh, evolution of U.S. policy led to the development of uh, a te the technology base for uh, a, uh, a, a technology program called Assault Breaker 2, which uh, DARPA is now engaged in developing the key enabling technologies to support the policy objective. Uh, the, uh, the, I can discuss that a little further if there's, there's interest. Uh, a third area that I'd uh, like to in, uh, uh, raise is um, uh, based on my reading of uh, uh, the interest of the, uh, the government is to develop opportunities in space. Uh, uh, and when Prime Minister Thatcher decided to withdraw from Britain's efforts to create its own space program in collaboration with the uh, European Union, uh, a private sector entity emerged committed to space system development. 
The effort was led by the University of uh, Surrey's highly regarded innovation, innovator in satellite system development, uh, Professor Mar Martin Sweeting. And it, uh, Surrey became a, a leading developer of small satellites that, that met many users' needs. He exploited the excess capacity that existed in exp expendable launch vehicles uh, that were on the market in, in the US, Europe, and uh, Russia, and later China. The, uh, the, uh, um, the, the use of small satellites provided uh, a, a way of, for many countries to gain access to space that was not practical with the uh, space system technology that was available at the time. Uh, uh, how, however, this has changed quite a bit. Small satellites have uh, now uh, uh, become understood as the way to, uh, to, uh, to go to space. And over the next decade, telecommunications companies, internet operators, and other users are expected to launch 40,000 small satellites into uh, uh, mostly low Earth orbit, but in some other or orbital planes as well. The emerging pa path to innovation in space offers some new operation uh, opportunities for British science and uh, technology. The uh, Billionaires Club, as I've described it, of extraordinary extraordinarily successful entrepreneurs that have developed, uh, have incorporated the development of reusable sp uh, space vehicles in their investment portfolio. This, in this innovation enables a vast reduction in the cost of uh, gaining access to space, and this appeared very quickly. Uh, in the, uh, w when the U.S. Space Shuttle, which was an effort to, to create a, uh, a reusable uh, path to uh, and putting uh, uh, s uh, space platforms in orbit, it would cost $54,000 per kilogram to put uh, a, uh, a payload in space. Uh, one of the early uh, uh, de uh, f deployments of the, the SpaceX Corporation of Elon Musk uh, uh, f to the International Space Station r reduced the cost to $2,700 per kilogram. So almost a factor of 20 in a reduction of the cost. Uh, the, uh, the, the rapidity with which reusable systems can place payloads in orbit further reduces the cost of space access for military operations as well. For example, again, SpaceX, uh, uh, Elon Musk has recently launched 60 satellites for the U.S. Air Force in four months. The, uh, using conventional expendable launch vehicle, such a task would have taken uh, years to complete. The advantage for pro pro uh, providing access to space is rapidly shifting away from the large-scale government-dominated space launch infrastructure to uh, a privately run reusable space launch system. With access to space becoming commoditized, an opportunity emerges for British science and engineering expertise to concentrate on space missions, applications, and payloads for both civil and uh, national defense operations to meet uh, uh, national needs. The, uh, the d discussions about the development of uh, a uh, 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 precision navigation and, and timing uh, satellite, the GNSS, the UK is a, is a good example of ways in which uh, 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 Britain will be able, able to gain access uh, to space. And I think if uh, uh, some uh, f uh, economic intelligence is applied to this problem, you, uh, you will f Britain will find, as the US has, uh, that the defense applications are a footnote to the, uh, to the larger co commercial applications. Those commercial applications uh, portend uh, uh, very substantial returns to investors. So uh, when that kind of thing happens, it's the sort of circumstances that aligns investment aspirations with uh, government needs. Uh, and so I, I believe there's some, some uh, opportunities there for uh, some collaboration with uh, private financing. Uh, uh, and, I, and I'd like to, to switch to... Uh, uh, some uh, the ideas about uh, how the UK can create a DARPA or, uh, or an ARPA and uh, some of the uh, lessons from US experience. Uh, uh, the, uh, per perhaps the most vexing, vexing question for uh, uh, the UK government is whether to create a DARPA-like institution 
and if it does, whether it can be organized in a manner that creates the sort of outcomes that have characterized the performance of its U.S. counterpart. The, there is evidence of strong support for the creation of such an institution, but the, some of the concepts that have at least been uh, exposed in the media uh, may pose significant risks to the uh, aspirations of its proponents. Several uh, departments of the U.S. government, as well as governments abroad, have, have sought to replicate uh, DARPA's success. Alas, uh, these efforts are unblemished by success. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I, I think there are some ways that uh, we can go, go forward which we'll uh, discuss here. Uh, DARPA is a technology-based institution that is focused on creating new capabilities, not technologies for the Department of Defense. And uh, there are uh, of, uh, of several uh, of uh, DARPA's uh, 22 former directors since, uh, 19, uh, uh, since 1958 have underscored DARPA's ha had an enduring description of its technology-based mission. It's uh, described as making pivotal investments in breakthrough technologies for national security and through its investment to catalyze the development of new capabilities that give the nation te uh, technology-based options for preventing and creating technology surprise. Uh, the, some of the words are particularly important, the, the idea of creating capabilities rather than perfecting uh, technologies is, is uh, an important uh, distinction that's uh, sometimes uh, lost and from the perspective of creating a uh, 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 or exploiting the civil applications of uh, these uh, technologies, the, uh, uh, the, the focus on uh, creating missions, uh, sorry, creating capabilities that support a mission, uh, the, the defense applications uh, almost uh, wholly uh, overlap the needs of uh, the civil society, which is why DARPA has been quite productive in producing uh, civil uh, spin-offs of the technologies that it's uh, developed for national defense. And I have uh, an uh, s some examples uh, uh, that I'll, I'll mention in a moment. Uh, to achieve the aims of, of uh, w operating at the frontiers of science and technology, to uh, apply technologies to the creation of uh, capabilities that can serve military missions. DARPA has a, a simple uh, six office structure that, that are not aligned e either by technology or mission application. Instead, they are focused on creating military capabilities and are so described by DARPA. Indeed, DARPA publishes a, a, an annual strategy document that, that describes its activities for the year, year ahead and the, and the uh, prepared version of the uh, uh, my uh, remarks. I have a reference to the URL for that uh, that document. Uh, the most recently created uh, office in, in DARPA is their uh, biological technologies office. The, uh, it the uh, uh, until recently the focus of um, DOD investment in in the biological sciences was mainly related to. Uh, uh, medicine and uh, the uh, use of chemical and biological uh, weapons for warfare. Those, uh, uh, the advances in biology quickly showed that uh, uh, biology had, had many more applications and so uh, DARPA's uh, technology office is looking at uh, biological processes, for example, that can be used for, for sensing, for computation, uh, for uh, computing, and, and other, uh, other applications at the, at the frontier of uh, uh, the exploitation of uh, uh, biological, uh, the biological sciences. They're, they also are developing uh, uh, technologies uh, and applications of those technologies to novel forms of bioterrorism, uh, innovative biological countermeasures to protect U.S. forces, and, uh, and to accelerate warfighter uh, readiness to overmatch and confront adversary threats. The, the, uh, there's quite a uh, dark side to the way um, uh, several nations are uh, developing biological sciences. The second uh, office in, in DARPA is, uh, uh, is one that I think um, may, may be of, uh, of interest here, at least to some of the discussions I've, I've uh, read about. 
uh, the, uh, the Defense Sciences Office is uh, sometimes described as DARPA's DARPA. They uh, are able to uh, uh, sur uh, surveil the uh, uh, field of technology developments in an effort to find ways in which uh, some of these technologies that may not be recognized by the uh, uh, Department of Defense to be able to, uh, uh, to exploit them. But uh, there's also th uh, some of the applications, especially we're seeing now in command and control, we don't have the mathematics to describe the, uh, uh, the applications of the technology. So uh, the uh, uh, Defense Sciences Office uh, has uh, uh, groups of mathematicians that are uh, working on addressing these, these kind of problems. Uh, the, in general, they're looking for, uh, for high risk and high payoff research initiatives across a broad spectrum of science and engineering disciplines to trans, uh, transform them into important game-changing game technologies for uh, U.S. national security. Uh, the, uh, some of the current uh, Defense Sciences Office, in, in, in addition to the mathematics that I mentioned, is computation and design, the limits of sensing and sensors, complex social systems, and anticipating surprise. The DSO re relies on greater sci scientific research community to help develop and explore ideas that could potentially revolutionize the state of the art. Uh, it's, uh, third office is uh, in, in the Information Innovation Office. Uh, modern society, as we are well aware, uh, de depends on uh, information, and information depends on information systems. Timely, insightful, reliable, and relevant information is essential, particularly for national security. To ensure uh, information advantage for the U.S. and its allies, the uh, Information Innovation Office uh, uh, with a catchy uh, uh, acronym, I2O, uh, sponsors basic and applies re research in three uh, thrust areas, symbiosis, analytics, and cyber. The uh, fourth uh, uh, office is the uh, Microsystems Technology Office. The Microsystem Technology Office core mission is to develop high performance, intelligent microsystems and next generation components to ensure U.S. dominance in areas of command control and communication, computing, intelligence, uh, surveillance and reconnaissance, electronic warfare, and directed energy. The effectiveness, survivability, and lethality of these systems is critically dependent on the microsystems uh, uh, contained in, in them. Uh, the uh, fifth area is the uh, Strategic Technology Office, which is f focuses on the application of technologies that enable uh, the armed forces to fight as a network and to increase the military effectiveness, cost leverage, and, and, and adaptability of these systems. Tactical Technology Office uh, provides uh, uh, to prevent a strategic or tactical surprise with high payoff, high risk developments and demonstration of relatively re revolutionary new platforms and ground systems, maritime and uh, service, uh, surface and undersea systems, air systems, and space systems. The importance of technology, uh, DARPA's technology-enabled focus is to create new capabilities, uh, as a, and this is the decisive dimension of uh, DARPA's RIT. It separates them from other organizations public or private within the DOD's national defense R&D ecosystem. Uh, uh, other organizations, such as, uh, as the laboratories for the military departments, apply an integrated suite of technologies re uh, relevant to the mission of their respective service. In many cases, developing service-specific applications of, for applications that have been demonstrated through a DARPA program. DARPA's concentration on the creation of capabilities mitigates a technological vice that is often associated with organizational structures that seek to create outcomes based on top-down priority to create specific outcome or outcomes in, in mission applications. This approach tends to create specific technology proponents who often develop a predisposition akin to the uh, a carpenter whose uh, who's only tool is a hammer, in which case every problem appears to be a nail. Uh, 
uh, efforts to create DARPA-like ent entities have fallen prey to more uh, traditional uh, governmental bureaucratic objections, uh, such as the opposition to lateral uh, entry into uh, government service, uh, authority-based processes to authorize the expenditure of appropriated funds, and layers of, of, uh, uh, of governmental supervision and, and auditing. Uh, the risks and difficulties associated with the creation of a UK DARPA uh, to address its aspirations for the development of a culture of innovation in government-sponsored R&D uh, needs to be addressed. However, there is no need to make the problem more difficult uh, than uh, necessary. And I have a few uh, thoughts on, on uh, doing that. But uh, based on a conversation I've had in the last couple of days, it might be uh, constructive to uh, use a, a concrete illustration of, uh, within the U.S. government of a, uh, call it a good DARPA and a bad DARPA, both trying to solve uh, similar problems. Uh, the Department of Energy uh, in 2007 created a uh, uh, ARPA-E for uh, uh, work in energy. It was created in 2007, an election in 2008, the, uh, the Obama administration came in with a different set of priorities, so uh, uh, RPE uh, was uh, reconfigured to focus on uh, an outcome uh, that it, 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 the administration was seeking. It, um, uh, its priority was the development of uh, renewable energy sources and, uh, and energy storage. It, it was a bit of a, uh, a self-licking ice cream cone kind of model where the uh, R&D funds were poured into uh, the development of uh, um, uh, b mainly lithium-based batteries and uh, uh, ever more efficient uh, solar uh, panels and uh, wind turbines. Uh, the, this was co complemented at the other end by uh, heavy subsidies to the use of uh, uh, re renewable energy. And the, 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 in some cases, uh, the subsidies were doubled down because in addition to the federal subsidies, which were already substantial, uh, additional subsidies by state governments were added as well. So the, the aspiration, of course, was, was to send a demand signal uh, about the enthusiasm for renewable uh, energy sources, which w was not uh, hard to, to uh, transmit uh, because uh, the, the uh, cost was, uh, was uh, quite low. And if you travel around in the states, especially the ones with uh, substantial subsidies, uh, you will find uh, uh, a high presence of, uh, of solar and, and uh, wind turbine technology. But, but uh, then uh, the bad news hit. The uh, uh, hydro hydro hydraulic fracturing w has been around for more than 50 years, but it was mo mostly used in the U.S. for uh, uh, secondary recovery from old uh, oil wells. The U.S. has uh, tens of thousands of uh, very small oil wells that produce uh, less than 20 barrels a day. And by using hydraulic fracturing, they were able to increase some of the output of these, of these wells. But uh, during the uh, early part of the 21st century, new technology was applied to hydraulic fracturing. And so areas that w were rich in uh, uh, natural gas and oil, uh, uh, West Texas, but also areas that did not have much uh, uh, oil and gas exploration uh, in, in certainly in recent years, such as North Dakota, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, uh, it, uh, caused the U.S. Um, position in energy to be uh, uh, upended. It went from a, a marginal producer of uh, oil and gas to uh, the, uh, today the uh, dominant uh, global producer of, of uh, oil and gas. That drove the, uh, the price down uh, substantially for uh, uh, oil and gas and uh, the, uh, uh, the subsidy benefits for uh, 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 renewable energies uh, uh, were uh, diminished. In addition, uh, th there was uh, a, a problem with uh, uh, dangerous dependencies being created by the emphasis on, uh, on lithium. Uh, China recognized that lithium w would be a, a, a crucial means of dealing with the intermi intermittent character of, uh, 
renewable energy uh, as, a, as a means of storing it. So they started buying up the uh, uh, lithium uh, uh, mining capacity in, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, Asia, and Africa. Uh, they, the U.S. government had already seen the consequences of China's manipulation of uh, raw materials in, uh, 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 in the uh, rare earths uh, uh, segment, and uh, so were very wary of the consequences of China's uh, increasing market power in, uh, uh, in uh, lithium. Uh, 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 to compare the uh, DARPA's un, uh, or ARPA's uh, ex uh, experience in the Department of Energy, the, in, in the uh, uh, Department of Defense, they also had a, uh, an energy problem. Uh, this was uh, uh, created as the, it was realized that the bad guys were implanting malicious code into uh, the uh, uh, computer networks that controlled the electric power grid. And, uh, and the uh, 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 other elements of our infrastructure. Ar Iranian malware was found in, in a, uh, uh, the control system for a series of dams in uh, New York State. And uh, so uh, uh, DARPA was asked to, to uh, look at, the, at this problem from the perspective of how can we mitigate the, the risk to our ability uh, to operate our military bases uh, during a, a time when they, these may be attacked. So uh, uh, DARPA, again, with a, a mission focus, in this case, uh, needing to uh, be able to allow the forces to deploy even if the power grid was uh, uh, selectively shut down or even extensively damaged. They um, uh, picked up some uh, technology, some of which was developed in the national labs for low enriched uranium uh, 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 reactors. Uh, some very interesting uh, heat exchanger technologies and Stirling motors uh, v uh, that are were quite efficient. And the, uh, the outcome was to produce uh, a small reactor that uh, could produce between 2 and 10 megawatt electric and uh, plenty uh, enough for, for most of the basing infrastructure we have and to package it in a way that it could sh uh, fit in the C-17. The, uh, uh, the uh, of course, small, uh, Department of Energy has been working for years also on, on small reactors, but the regulatory uh, environment is, uh, makes the development of any new, uh, new reactor of, uh, of very prolonged activity, and as a result, there's been very little innovation in the nuclear sector. What DARPA has, has done is to work uh, out arrangements and uh, U.S. Army funding to, uh, with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission so that they are going to, uh, if th their plans uh, work out, have a licensable uh, small reactor of, of this sort. The, the belief th that they have, which uh, is probably likely to be upended on costs, was around $100 million a, a reactor. Uh, and so w what you can see is, yes, DARPA worked on fulfilling a, uh, a mission requirement that was urgent for the Department of Defense, but they probably needed a couple of dozen of these reactors. But you can imagine j inverting the, um, the paradigm of uh, civil electric power, which since uh, the 20s, when the U.S., uh, 1920s, when the U.S. was becoming electrified, the, uh, what we, we built very big centralized uh, reactors of either uh, uh, conventional fuel or nuclear, the power was put into a power grid and that formed the, the base load for uh, U.S. Uh, energy. But if you can distribute the power uh, through small reactors that are not too expensive, uh, the ability to have a much more resilient uh, uh, electric power system, have the technology uh, uh, such that uh, you, you can uh, have large numbers of small uh, reactors. You, you again say invert the, uh, the paradigm. We have 94 nuclear reactors now. They're uh, of advanced age, and, uh, uh, but it's, it constitutes almost 20 percent of the power grid. Just replacing the nuclear uh, power uh, is, uh, is worth doing, but if you were able to replace the entire fossil fuel uh, network that now is, is part of our uh, uh, 
uh, electric power generation, you can see that the uh, 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 that the uh, uh, benefits uh, to, to be applied to uh, uh, re reducing uh, uh, carbon footprint and and emissions would would be uh, would be very substantial uh, and. Uh, uh, in uh, just a few miles from here, in the city of London, it's the uh, uh, the epicenter of uh, financial engineering jujitsu. And when you can see the uh, kind of uh, opportunities that would be created to to modernize uh, the global electric power industry through the application of uh, a modern form of uh, nuclear reactors that was initially developed for uh, uh, a limited defense application, I think you can see the, uh, uh, the, uh, the parallel civil development that might be a, a, a very powerful uh, uh, a way of uh, um, ad advancing the uh, power generation for the civil market. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, another a aspect of this, as I said, because uh, the uh, because there's been very few ex successful examples of uh, creating a DARPA-like entity, uh, it, it may be constructive to build on some of our uh, existing institutional arrangements, which in the case of working with, uh, 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 with, with the UK are, are abundant and uh, uh, well organized. The, uh, in the year 2000, the U.S. Uh, and Britain uh, negotiated a bilateral MOU uh, in, uh, uh, in defense R&D. Uh, th this uh, 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 agreement was negotiated uh, when uh, the British firm BAE Systems bought a very sensitive um, uh, firm, uh, the Sanders Associates, which was a, a, a big uh, uh, player in uh, information operations, which was a very sensitive uh, part of the U.S. Uh, military capabilities and defense R&D. The Defense Department authorized the uh, BAE systems to buy and operate that company in the U.S., and it was seen as a, as a sort of catalyst to, to modernize the uh, R&D relationship. So if one of the things that we might find constructive is to build on that relationship to, to have a more collaborative effort between uh, the UK's aspirations to build a, uh, a, a British ARPA, uh, recognizing the, the differences in the institutional setting, but uh, nevertheless building on the, the kind of experience that the U.S. has had that has made uh, uh, DARPA a particularly effective uh, institution for the uh, development of R&D to, to meet uh, national defense needs, but also uh, as a platform for the development of uh, remarkable uh, uh, civil sef sector applications. Um, the uh, scale of the U.S. Uh, R&D uh, ecosystem also some, uh, offers some opportunities for uh, a UK ARPA to develop relations with institutions that do not have counterparts in the US, in the UK system, particularly federally funded research and development centers. Uh, the DOD has 40 of these. Uh, uh, the RAND Corporation is an illustration of that, but not, by no means the only one. Um, and uh, the, these kind of institutions are, are particularly helpful in, in, uh, in the setting where we, we might want to try and transfer some combination of institutional knowledge and, uh, and organization. Uh, a, a second uh, institutional opportunity uh, resides with the existence of the U.S.-U.K. Defense Trade Cooperation Treaty. This is a 2007 uh, treaty. The, the, the treaty itself is... Uh, is a particularly uh, good instrument to facilitate uh, uh, collaboration between the U.S. and the U.K. in developing modern defense products and also to create defense markets for these, uh, these products. The problem with it is on the U.S. side. Uh, the two successive chairmen of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee that uh, had jurisdiction over the ratification of the 2007 treaty because it, it, it uh, took about three years to get it ratified. The first was uh, then Senator uh, Biden, uh, who, uh, and his successor was Senator John Kerry, both of whom uh, disliked uh, arms transfers, and so they did not uh, find it in, their, in US, what they believed to be U.S. interest to facilitate uh, defense cooperation 
uh, defense industrial cooperation between allies. So they imposed a regulatory regime on the uh, Department of State, which manages these uh, relationships that uh, interdicted the, the treaty to the point where it no longer operates. But now, um, in, two th in, in the DOD legislation in 2017, the Congress authorized DOD to incorporate Britain as part of the U.S. industrial base. So the opportunities for a, a much more intimate uh, relationship exist quite apart from the, the point I mentioned earlier about uh, uh, the uh, defense investment in, uh, in, uh, by U.K. companies, which is, say, there, there are about 150 U.K. companies that have a uh, defense industrial presence in the U.S. market, uh, able to access uh, uh, classified material, uh, uh, have contract uh, rights equal to U.S. indigenous companies, and can uh, participate in the foreign uh, military sales program, which is uh, about two-thirds the size of the, uh, the U.S. defense procurement budget. So it's, it's like a separate big country, uh, but a, a, remar a remarkable market. And uh, the uh, third, although somewhat less institutionalized, but, but derived from my own experience, is uh, uh, collaboration on uh, joint uh, studies of defense-related R&D. Uh, as I said, when I served as chairman of the Defense Science Board, we had a, a collaborative program with the UK um, uh, uh, d uh, Defense Scientific a advisory Committee, and it was uh, it produced a very useful study. I've included the URL in in the in my uh, uh, paper, uh, and uh, it's it, it was done on uh, focusing on joint areas of appli uh, application for uh, mission application for both uh, the U.S. And, and Britain. It was it was a good study, but it was uh, uh, proved hard to, to replicate because of the. Uh, the regulatory difficulties in managing technology transfer. Environment is now much better, and I think we, we have some, uh, some good opportunities. So I'll uh, uh, stop there. Be glad to take any uh, uh, questions or uh, p uh, be, receive pitch mark, pitchforks as required. Thank you. Questions? I'm sure there are many. Lady there, name an organization. Give you my credit. Yeah, yeah. I work for one of the federally funded research and development Great. Um, uh, for the Space the Aerospace Corporation. Great. And we're now here working with the RAS. So that's the big deal. The question I want to ask is uh, GNSS. Yeah. <coughs> Do you think it's significant or is there any significance at all or nothing at all in the fact that the AE has just bought the GPS uh, interest? Just of, uh, Right. Uh, precision navigation and, and targeting is a vital uh, aspect of both uh, uh, our uh, civil and, and uh, uh, military life, and there's uh, 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 good reasons to uh, increase the capacity of that system. The U.S., is, as you probably know from your work with uh, Aerospace Corporation, is, is uh, concerned about the vulnerability of uh, PNT systems, and there, there's a lot of activity going on to, to uh, protect them. Uh, having uh, more capacity, introducing uh, more modern uh, technologies for the uh, ability of the uh, satellites to uh, resist uh, jamming, uh, re uh, resist uh, more s uh, subtle forms of cyber operations where uh, things are implanted in the command and control system of the satellites and so forth. I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity, but also, uh, f uh, as we were discussing earlier, the, the uh, uh, civil applications are uh, also potentially uh, substantial, and one of the ways of, uh, I believe, of mitigating the, uh, uh, the cost in appropriated funds for this is to, to get investors involved in the early uh, part of the pro process who would be able to access uh, the intellectual property that supports the civil applications of uh, uh, what, depending on how uh, the UK organizes it, it may be a, a regional um, PNT system or it may be used over a larger area. I'm, I'm not familiar with the current state of play and in, in U.S. thinking about it, but I, I think it's a, it's a uh, a, a valuable thing, but but uh, some creativity ought to be imp applied because it's now, uh, you know, more than 40 years since uh, G uh, GPS was deployed, and we've learned a lot since then about it. 
gentleman there. Name and organisation, please. Um, Alan Thompson from Skyrora, which is a space organisation. The question's obviously about space as well. Um, I'd be interested to know if uh, the USA, it's in the USA interests to support, perhaps through a DARPA organisation, the commoditization of space that you mentioned, and whether you think that the US would be interested in a, a, a again, a uh, access from the UK, UK its own first, um, access to low Earth orbit for itself, its sovereign access, and yeah. commo commercializing that model. Understanding that at the moment, as you mentioned, the SpaceX example of pushing the price down to $2,700 a kilogram, I think actually the market is still not uh, an open market and there's no real fair competition. Mm -hmm. And I'm just interested in the context of this discussion and the collaboration that already exists around the, the uh, defense industry taking it to a commercial would that be in, uh, of, of interest to the U.S.? Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good question. One of the great things about the, uh, the commoditization of, of space, as I've described it, because you, a lot more uh, satellites can be in orbit, the, the opportunities for uh, uh, hosting of other uh, applications on satellites is, uh, is a very uh, prominent one that can contribute both to the utility of, of the space platforms and their uh, proliferation. For example, putting cameras in, uh, uh, say, 10% of the 40,000 satellites that are going to be up there uh, and, uh, and, and integrate them with uh, computers, uh, uh, computers always beat glass. You, the the uh, um, uh, scale of uh, uh, commercial as well as uh, defense applications by being able to leverage the, uh, uh, the proliferation of, of satellites is, is profound. Similarly for uh, uh, communications, the uh, uh, ability to uh, use uh, laser communications technology to, uh, you know, create an internet in space with a very high capacity uh, linked uh, links uh, based on laser communications, you know, is, is, is another example. And these were not practical when we were putting 15-ton satellites in orbit that cost uh, two and a half billion dollars. Now, the, uh, uh, thanks to the innovations of Surrey and, and others, uh, the technology is, has changed, and now that the uh, cost of access to space is, is dropping like a rock, uh, I think there's, there's a real opportunity for the UK to get back in the space business in a big way. Gentleman there, yes, in the middle, name and organization, yes. <coughs> Yeah. Clearly, there is a cultural difference in the way this organization is set up. You're away from, I think you call it us and the culture, the high walls of those. You're open. Um, and you have scale and access to those R&D centers. But are there other lessons for us? Uh, you gave a tantalizing reference, I think, to uh, auditing and supervision. Right. right. Other lessons for us here in the way in which we audit and supervise, and indeed risk, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it, it's a great uh, uh, question, and I uh, appreciate it because that's uh, uh, almost exactly the uh, question that's replicated in, in other institutions that have tried to uh, come up with this uh, sort of approach. And and, and I th I think the the way it's uh, done is there's there's a first a, a high de degree of risk tolerance. The uh, uh, if, if you ever have an opportunity to deal with uh, the program managers in DARPA, that uh, a, 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 uh, an experiment failure is not a failure. It's, it's something that they learn so that they can uh, uh, make uh, subsequent improvements in, in the science. Uh, DARPA has developed a reputation for a very disciplined uh, approach to uh, uh, to uh, developing uh, new technologies or applications of technologies to create these capabilities to meet mission requirements. So uh, if uh, their program managers who uh, come in uh, to work uh, for three to five years in, in DARPA are uh, themselves experts in their areas of interest and they come in filled with ideas about how to 
how to uh, apply them to uh, defense missions. Uh, the, uh, DOD has also worked uh, uh, an issue to develop a pipeline of people in academia, universities, uh, uh, think tanks, and so forth who want to do this kind of work for uh, a few years to uh, find an outlet for some of their uh, technology aspirations. And uh, it's proven to be uh, uh, quite uh, successful. The, the uh, ascending way in which they uh, uh, commit uh, public funds to uh, uh, these developments is, uh, is, is also interesting. If you, uh, the, the program managers will publish a uh, request for information about uh, dealing with uh, an effort to try and achieve some uh, military capability for uh, mission purpose. They, they may get a few dozen responders. Uh, and uh, they'll, the program manager will pick out uh, the two or three uh, ones that look like they have the, the most mature ideas and thought out. They've, they've gone through modeling and simulation of, of the ideas, or they have some idea that the physical principle may work. And uh, if they can persuade the um, uh, program manager that uh, this has a ch chance of working, they'll get uh, perhaps $500,000 to develop an experiment. And if the experiment uh, looks like it will achieve some results, they may get uh, a million or two million bucks to actually run the experiment. And in many cases, especially now that the, the technologies that uh, create modern defense capabilities are not created in the defense industry. So they will often team up uh, a, a, a small company that's developed this stuff with a systems uh, integrator so that they will be able to um, uh, help the developer fit the technology into a, a defense application, and maybe in an aircraft or a ship or, or uh, whatever. We, we've uh, had, uh, f for example, quite a lot of interest from companies that are involved in the Internet of Things, because there's a joint project between the Army and DARPA uh, to um, depopulate the zone of close combat in uh, ground forces. The, the, the technology makes it possible to, uh, to, to take the, uh, the human out of the, this kind of uh, meat grinder that's been a characteristic of uh, kinetic warfare for th thousands of years by having uh, uh, sensing uh, 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 on robotic platforms. You don't need 80-ton armored vehicles anymore because there's no person in it. They're linked with, the, uh, with airborne uh, uh, surveillance and command and control and uh, re uh, remotely operated, the, it, it seems like it's, it's going to be possible. Well, a lot of the te this technology is coming out of the IoT industry. Uh, it's just that it's being scaled and uh, purposed for uh, these defense applications. And, and a lot of this sort of thing is, is, is out there in such a way that, that uh, it, it, the process that uh, DARPA uses has uh, retained the credibility of the uh, uh, of the uh, people who are entrusted with public funds. I had served on the Defense Appropriations uh, Committee uh, on the staff when I was uh, I worked on the Hill, and the, the, uh, the, the Congress has a very high regard for what uh, DARPA does. If there turned out to be some scandal, that would obviously be uh, a negative, but they've gone through 60 years without any, any of these problems because they they, they don't, there's no 10-year program in, in DARPA. They, they may have two or three years when they work on it, and then they hand it off to, the, to a user, the Army or the, the uh, other military departments or defense-wide agencies. But uh, uh, because DARPA has no infrastructure, they, they have no labs, they have no test ranges, uh, they, they have none of the apparatus that uh, uh, it creates problems with uh, public funds. Uh, or at least mitigates the risk of uh, problems with public funds. It's, it's proven to be uh, uh, quite an accepted uh, uh, way of doing business, and it's, uh, it's re very well regarded by the Congress. I see lots more questions. I'm just trying to catch a gentleman there in the middle. Name an organization, please. Uh, thank you. Ian e e Alex from the UK Space Agency. Um, and first of all, Dr. Schneider, I'd like to, to thank you for taking us from the depths of tracking up to low Earth orbits and through a number of virtual domains on the way. Um, but I'd like to go back to 
your statement around the slide of the regulatory control yeah. and less regulations can promote um, uh, innovation. <coughs> Given the challenges that you had around changing the Outer Space Act of 1967 to suit commercialization of space and the change in nature, uh, where do you think that slide is? Uh, it's it's a very uh, pertinent question because if if we uh, are really going to see uh, 40,000 um, satellites going up in the next decade or so, uh, the uh, the way in which uh, space is regulated is 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 got to mature. Uh, the, uh, I think there are good opportunities now with the technologies of uh, of uh, managing debris that uh, uh, you can imagine an insurance industry that can be built up around uh, the need to uh, ensure other uh, users of space that, that the platforms are not uh, inexpertly operated in such a way that they will damage uh, other parts of the, uh, uh, the, the space uh, system that's, uh, that's in place. The, uh, uh, the, there's uh, a self-interest on the part of uh, users of space that have, has worked uh, pretty well in being able to uh, to manage orbital slots and to uh, uh, to manage other aspects of it. There's some problems, of course, with the military use of space because of the uh, uh, enthusiasm that uh, some have for uh, direct descent uh, anti-satellite systems, but uh, uh, that probably will give way to uh, more subtle uh, ways uh, of uh, military applications for it. But I, I think the, uh, uh, the opportunities for uh, having a more self-regulated uh, use of space is becoming increasingly possible because of the technologies of uh, in space. So I think uh, I'm uh, optimistic and, and uh, space may avoid the uh, fate of the uh, nuclear industry that has, has been so heavily regulated that it is not innovative. Time is short. I know that I have to take the remaining questions as a group if you're happy to yeah, sure. answer them. Lady there and anyone else. Name an organization, please. Yeah. Do I ju I'll just see who else okay. wants to ask? Is there anyone else who wanted to ask a question just in the final? Anyone else wants to catch Mr. Speaker's eye? Okay. Without glasses, you have to wave madly. <laughs> good. Okay. You want to answer? Yeah. Well, I, I think it raised a good question that's uh, of more um, uh, general application about some of the new technologies that uh, make people nervous. Uh, one of the current projects that uh, DARPA is, is working on relates to AI. And uh, AI has, uh, uh, has uh, produced a, a considerable fear factor of, of uh, it being able to, to take over um, uh, human decision making. And uh, so the, uh, the project came out of uh, uh, discussions about the promise of AI to combatant commanders. And the combatant commander says, I'm not going to uh, try and manipulate lethal force if I don't know what the source of, of the conclusions are. So DARPA is focusing on a project called Explainable AI, uh, which I think has great uh, potential utility because the, the, the fear factor is outweighing the, uh, uh, the, the uh, benefits of applying this, uh, this technology. And uh, indeed, many people are not aware of how extensive the AI applications already are. So I, I think this is a, an illustration of uh, 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 DARPA's uh, work that's supporting a, a military mission because the combatant commander is not going to make decisions unless they understand the basis for it. But you have, uh, um, you know, many other things of, of this property that uh, 
uh, that if, if people better understand how it how it can be applied, it's uh, it can propel its uh, uh, its civil applications and qu quantum applications are going to uh, having the same thing where uh, the focus now is uh, on uh, quantum computing and and uh, quantum uh, encryption, which is uh, 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 in like, if properly handled, is going to be great value and can mitigate uh, perhaps some of the problems we we currently have with um, uh, f uh, foreign control of the uh, information technology system. That is, uh, if we have uh, 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 the quantum encryption, it'll it'll be possible to bypass some of the uh, uh, m uh, threats to the information uh, infrastructure that uh, might otherwise be. Uh, exercised by those who's, who manage the uh, uh, communications technology. Thank you. Well, it's been, a, Go ahead. It's, been a, it's been a wonderful week for policy exchange in this sense. Well, you kindly wrote the foreword to uh, our new paper, Visions of ARPA, edited by Ian Mansfield, our outstanding head of science and uh, education here. We've spoken to also to our work on space, which we're the only think tank with a space unit uh, presently, and Prime Minister employed the words of our study in his opening statement on the steps of Downing Street. So this is a happening area, and uh, like all great teachers, Bill, you make it all sound very easy, particularly for the thicker pupils in the audience. Uh, like myself, it's uh, been a master class. As I say, the range never fails to astonish. So please uh, join me in expressing appreciation to our guest of honour tonight. Thank you. Thank you.